All right, I think we can start with our introductions of uh, the doctors who are hosting this event tonight. We have Professor Carol Ben, who doesn't really need further introduction. Thank you again for joining us, Carol. I know you, this is about your fifth or sixth webinar in the series, and we're looking for it. And we also have Dr. Hart, a specialist on survivorship, our topic for tonight. I'm going to move over to our two doctors, and they can introduce. Right, well, I'm going to introduce Liz, and I'm just going to start off by saying that um, survivorship is, for me, what we're doing in life every single day. We have these curveballs thrown at us, and sometimes we just don't have a, a way to go or how to break down and manage our support that we require. And something Liz said to me a while ago really resonated with me. Dr. Hart, I've worked with her for many, many, many years. Okay. Don't say how, don't make me look even older, Liz. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're the boys when you need them. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so really, for many years, she's uh, works with us in theatre. She's a integral part of our MDM. In fact, she sat on our meetings when we had our accreditation last year, and there were lots of international comments in terms of what she does and what she offers. So it's taken us a while to really formalize it, sitting together, uh, working out how it fits into the click of a big multidisciplinary team for patients. And before Liz introduced herself, for me, I remember speaking to you about a patient who had a, um, a stroke during her chemo and then a car accident and then just couldn't see her way around how to manage going forward with her cancer journey got a recurrence and then um and, you, and you've spoken to her and your comment was if i'd spoken to her sooner um we could have helped because life throws us these curveballs and we just sometimes need someone who's maybe not the clinician who's looking after us to help break down and guide us in terms of prioritizing how we're going to manage so thank you very very much for being on um, this meeting tonight and i'm just going to let you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and what you do i think you put a couple of slides together or just yes, a, i can a, just i don't need to i just yeah i can just talk um uh, firstly thank you so much carol for this opportunity i think the big thing to to remember about carol is that she's got this global vision of of where breast cancer should be going um and she sees things before anyone else does that need the things that need doing and she's been talking to me because i did a, a health coaching I'm a, I'm a medical doctor by training and i've been working in the breast center in the breast care unit for 18 years now i think but more on the surgical side and i did the health coaching course um and since then she's been saying to me you know you need to do survivorship and i it's taken me a while to kind of get my head around what that would mean etc but i think we kind of getting some some traction now so um i'm absolutely loving this whole um aspect of cancer care because i think it, it uses all my skills i'm i'm a medical doctor i was a gp for a while and then i've been in the surgical side as an assistant surgeon but then um, i've done the health coaching course so i'm really passionate about coaching i think it's one of the things that you that, that it's one of the, the ways you can help people really um get to grips with with where they're at and you know and and the changes that are happening because change management is hard um but coaches are really good at that um at helping people change so um yeah for me this is just a a fabulous a fabulous opportunity and i really think we can make a huge difference yeah Thank you so much. So starting off as normal with our webinars, what we're going to do, we're going to have a very casual conversation tonight. I do have a bunch of questions that have been sent in ahead of time. I also welcome anyone who's attending to post some questions in the chat or the Q&A. And uh, in between the questions that we have and the doctors talking, we will ask them your specific questions. We welcome you to interact and chat with us. Um, and to start off, I'm going to hit us off on our first question. Uh, Liz, Prof, uh, a term that you won't find in most medical textbooks, but what actually is survivorship care? So I am going to start by saying that life throws you curveballs every day and we just going and survivorship is not really my best word because it kind of means that we scraping our way through our days and 
when you get diagnosed with a cancer, it's overwhelming. So it, it really, survivorship is day by day for every person, but around cancer care, it requires a particular amount of structuring and it doesn't take away the work that other doctors are doing. What it's supposed to do is glue it together. And I've had people contact in with me, well, why am I not on, I'm doing this in survivorship and I'm doing that and I'm doing, this is a specific way. What Liz is doing is coordinating and bringing the team together with the patient at the center to help guide every aspect of your care. So it doesn't take away from your oncologist or your surgeon or your radiation oncologist or your GP survivorship specialist who's going to help you on your day to day. I think one of your questions you commented is, and can your general practitioner manage you? Absolutely, it's hard going back into oncology suite, but how do you coordinate your care from a prehabilitation to a rehabilitation with everything from exercise to dietetics to supplements you're taking? How do you get that assistance to know where to turn and how to manage? I don't know, Liz, if you want to add on to what I'm saying. Yes. I, you know, I think survivorship is the, the the definition is that it starts the moment you diagnose and it's, it carries on for the rest of your life because um, cancer survivors are a very specific population that, that have a very, very specific challenges. And um, it's very difficult for a busy oncology team. I mean, your whole focus um, is is to get rid of this cancer, you know, um, and, and that's what you are absolutely focused on. Plus, which all the specialists are so busy, um, you know, with, with all the different patients they've got to see. So I see my role as kind of being yeah, sort of almost that in-between person that can can support you in the areas where you, where you don't feel, um, where you feel you just need a little bit more. And... Um, so some people I've seen once and some people I see six times in a row. It just depends where, where you're at and, and, and what you need. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you very much for that. Thank you very much. So there's one or two questions here that I feel we've already touched on, but just let's get answers for them locked in place. And I'm going to group them together for you. First off is, is your description of survivorship seems very, very broad, and there's a lot to add into it. If I was to tell someone else about survivorship, what 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 I say, what does it entail? I've struggled with this question, you know, to try to explain to people. It takes me a long time to explain it because it's just so, it is so broad. Mm. Um, and I, I think I've sort and of different, said, different mm, for each person. Different for each person. So, mm. so if you are a 27 year old diagnosed with a breast cancer, your needs are different to an 88 year old who's reliant on family or other people for transport. It is different. We we all have different um, concepts of around our bodies and what we are concerned about. And we're concerned about how any treatment is going to affect them. So for one person that need is completely different and their the treatment is different to another person and some people um are, are, are right on the winnie the pooh personality types like i'm a little bit like maybe piglet or tigger bouncing around and then some people are the christopher robbins that they want to have everything written down and understood and know what they think their answers are and then they're people who are going to social media out should i do this and so sometimes having that person to um, throw questions and answers off to guide them about how they can manage specific for them is important. So it doesn't take away, okay, I'm going to keep on saying this, your oncologist, your surgeon, your radiation oncologist, your general practitioner, person who's going to check out your um how you manage your exercise oncology and your cholesterol and your bone density around your treatment but they're going to coordinate where there are possibly gaps which are not giving you a, a, a sense of satisfaction that you are being able to manage with what you so importantly said earlier change which is so difficult for all of us mm. Yeah, exactly. 
I mean, I saw a lady today and she just came because she'd just been diagnosed three weeks ago. And you get any of you who've who've gone through this journey, you get funneled into this tunnel and it's just things are thrown at you. You this hospital, that hospital, that test, this test, etc. And it, it's it's overwhelming. And so she just came and she spent an hour with me and I was just able to to kind of talk her through okay, this is what's happening next. Remember, you've got to look after yourself. She was worrying about everybody else in her life like she always did. And I was able to focus her. So it's it's a very individual and it it, it, it depends on, on where you are. And I think that's where the coaching uh, training has helped me is just to try and meet people where they're at and then work with, with that um, and, and as we move forward. Fantastic. And I know some of the questions coming up you have already alluded to, but as I said, let's go deeply into them. I'm going to join the next three questions together because they kind of create a bit of a whole package. First one is, when do I need to start with a care plan? And that joins perfectly with, uh, for how long should I be on this care plan? And perhaps you can wrap that up with a bit of an understanding about who should make the plan for me. And I'm going to put my own understanding and caveat in there before you answer that I understand we've got the specialist on generating survivorship care plans here. And ideally, that should be where it comes from. But is, is there anyone one else within the treating team that would be involved in this? Well, I think it starts off with your any person who has a cancer diagnosis should not even consider starting any treatment until it's been properly discussed in a robust multidisciplinary environment. So that's your start. Remember, it's your body, not the doctors. You're entitled to other opinions. And this is where your survivorship life coach glue comes together because it may be that what has been recommended for you at this stage is too overwhelming. And that person will coordinate back with the multidisciplinary team to work out what our timelines, what our structures are, where we can change, where we can individualize. Because treatment today is de-escalated, less is more, and it's very, very personalized. So it starts with a good clinical multidisciplinary plan a diagnosis and this is ongoing because at different phases of your treatment your particular journey should come back and if you are concerned I have people contact in with me and I say right we're going to take it back to the MDM or you have um, problems afterwards with compliance on treatment it should go back what are the other options etc because from clinician point of view we are clear what are the principles around managing a cancer the life coach survivorship glue is going to take you and that and coordinate the two Thank you very much, Prof. And I don't know if you want to add on, on to that, Dr. Hart, if there's any um, other recommendations around the, the starting and the ending of the plan and who's going to manage it for you. I think Prof did answer that quite comprehensively, but before we move on. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as I said, as Carol said at the beginning, uh, you know, the earlier I get involved, the better. You know, my absolute ideal would be to see every patient as they, you know, just within days of being diagnosed. But I just don't, I just, I don't have capacity right now to do that. But I think that would be ideal because then we've got a relationship we can take forward. And as you need me, you can, you can then, you know, the patient can kind of tap in. That would be ideal. But right now, obviously, I don't do any prescribing at all. I don't have any opinion on on really on the on the treatment plan because that has been decided by people who really understand and know these things my my role is to is to understand what that those treatments are and and how you know how how you going to get on with them and if that's too intimidating we'll talk about how but but yeah that that's my role and i okay. and i think think what's important also is to understand so i think that's spectacular and maybe what we need to do is set up a google form around so people you can work in and work out who needs to be seen when but you have a once off some people may never need further interactions etc others may be absolutely fine until you are post your primary treatment and you have a callback on a mammogram and a wobbly and then all of a sudden your fragility or something happens to somebody else that you know whose cancer comes back and yours has and and it creates anxiety in you so it's really 
has to be individualized, but you need to know that the service is available. Mm -hmm. Because by understanding that, you know that there's a tap in for your needs analysis. And like Liz says, it's not about prescribing your medicine or checking your blood pressure or working out everything. It's coordinating it in with the team. Because I think, Dom, you mentioned one of the questions is, who's the doctor that you should have the most follow-up with? It's whoever you feel most comfortable with. You need to have a sensible, safe, what, what we've done is we've got a survivorship passport. You've got one for during your treatment and for afterwards. But at any stage, you feel that you are not either getting the answers or something is not right you need to be able to tap in and if you're not getting the answers the person to speak to is your survivorship glue to ensure that they can tap in with the doctors and this is different from navigation navigation is your organizational aspect of through your treatment journey. So we have nurse navigators and financial navigators, and that's different to someone who's looking at, I want to call it your mental health and well being around going through what you're going through. Thank you very much, Prof. And you almost answered another question that we had there of whether they need to see all their treating doctors or just one doctor. And your answer of who you feel comfortable and how you feel comfortable yeah. makes a lot of sense yeah. to me as well. If you're comfortable with the whole team, keep with the whole team. If there's one particular doctor that you resonate with, go with that. Uh, there is a question that came in now in our Q and answer session that I think is very difficult to answer and even comment on, but I'm gonna leave it in, in, in your hands to do so. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on the question as well from my own experience in speaking with the, the the patients that I've been in contact with. It's from Francesca, and she asks, how realistic is this in the government hospitals? She yeah. mentions how she was alone from start to finish yeah. with a different doctor speaking to me in each yeah. step of the ways. I know even with people I've spoken to that they yeah. had a different doctor each day that they were in for treatment, and it was difficult having that one relationship would you like to make any comments on this very sensitive topic so when i was away um last week i was contacted in i think by one of the news channels to do something around and they wanted to look back around what we i went through at helen joseph and really it was around something that had happened with a journalist and the issue was to try and work out what is the best positive slant how can we improve and I think this is what Liz is showing and doing. We all have room for improvement. And for me, the comment was not around saying this is what everything's wrong from a government point of view. But if you are seeing different doctors, I think there's a common courtesy with introducing yourself to somebody. Hi, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm seeing you today. I think that there is a need for patients in government to have some form of passport of what their treatment is it always surprises me how little they are given and told about the information but there's also onus on people to ask okay and i know liz commented on busy and busy in government services lots of patients but that still does not take away from a fundamental this is my name tag this is who i am respectfully hello how are you whether i'm the porter the cleaner the clerk the nurse the doctor the professor this is your treatment plan and even from our government patient point of view this is where the breast health foundation comes in navigators around here how we can help you around side effects of treatment and those where we um help out so that people know their direction because often having treatments in different hospitals whether it's private or government is hugely intimidating for people. So there's an onus on a patient, I think, to ask, okay? And there's a huge responsibility from anyone in the healthcare, whether it be allied or medical, to be A, introduce yourself, B, be respectful, and three, be able to answer questions around somebody's body that is their temple, and they need to understand what's happening. Mm. I'm also trying, um, you know, I'm just starting out here, but I've, I've I've established a little website and I'm going to start putting things on there that'll just be free access stuff. You know, that people can just access for information and that sort of thing. And then if they really want to get questions answered, you know, maybe there'll be an option to do that too. 
um, that I can help with. It's just um, the the job is so enormous with 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 the state. So you know we can maybe think out the box a little bit of and how to help people. And maybe look at one of the now in October awareness to see if we can't get some form of funding, okay, mm. to help out with the systems because uh, I mean you've heard me on whether you're sitting on the back seat in the plane or the front seat in the plane. You need a safe takeoff and landing and your journey mm. needs to be safe. You may not have all the bells and whistles, but we owe that to people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I'd love to, I'm, uh, you know, I'm open to ideas of how to get involved yeah. in that space. Yeah. Thank you so much for your response there. And, and the parting comment from Francesca, she thanks us as well as this is the terrifying aspect of being told by the doctors is you need to calm down. Um, moving on, <laughs> Dr. Hart, I'm going to address this to you, and it's going to be my last sort of clarifying question around survivorship. And it comes in saying, in between the survivorship doctor and your GP, in managing your general health, does that relationship sort of overflow? Should I lean more towards my survivorship doctor if I'm now being treated in, in an oncology center? What, um, what would your recommendation be around that? Yes, it's interesting because I, I was a GP and I mean, I, I can treat these things, that, 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 but that's not really my job to treat your general health, actually. That's not really what I'm, I'm supposed to be doing. Obviously, I know how to recognize things and I can point you in the right direction. But I, ideally, you know, we, we want to have a good connection with the GP and I could absolutely, you know, sp speak to the you know your GP directly uh, do a referral letter or whatever's needed um ideally a GP should take over your care also at the end of the cancer treatment yeah. um but you know not everybody has a good relationship with their GP you know and so perhaps it's worth have finding one <laughs> that you can do that with but yeah it's not really my my role um so, Thank you very much. So, so Liz, for me, more and more, I see your role as a very unique role in survivorship because we have mm -hmm. survivorship GPs, we have prehab and rehab specialists, we have people to manage around lymphedema, exercise oncology. I see you as the glue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that person who can say, here I'm hearing, this is what I understand, and this is how we gain to. And also because you you work with us, you're a, you're a uh, colleague etc you have no qualms in speaking to an oncologist about something or phoning up a gp and saying listen this lady is really battling with her arthritis symptoms and her weight i've sat on the mdm this is the recommendation um here so that they have a way to manage their patients better because that's what it's all about mm -hmm. it's it it's it's getting up in the morning and and, and knowing that you have to take these medications or you're going through surgery or you're going through treating it as hard how do we make that day better for you yeah exactly. thank you very much doctors i've got a couple of questions that have come in from the chat but i'm actually going to ask a quick one here that, that i think i sadly already know the question the answer to and i'm going to let you respond to it. the question comes in does medical aid include survivorship care under my oncology benefit? No, it doesn't. Um, because I, I have a you know practice number, et cetera, I can I charge as a GP. Um, but I don't the, the yeah. And I think really that the more we do of this and the better yeah. Um, evidence we get about how impactful it is, et cetera. I think we can eventually start at, one, at some point we can go to the medical aids, but at the moment, I don't think so. Hey, Carol. Yeah. No, 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 they don't. But the nice thing from a general practitioner, you'll put it through as a general practitioner code, but actually it should be a, a, a complete separate basket. And the value of the basket mm. is by having help helps compliance. Mm. Okay. And anyone with any chronic health care condition will, will know how difficult it is to maintain compliance, mm -hmm. whether it's your antidepressants, your hypertensive medicines, your cholesterol medicines with side effects, your chronic oncology medicines, and fitting that in around with work-life balance, okay, and family, etc. And Happy, healthy people make for a happy, healthy community. And it really 
breaks my heart. I had a, a lady who, in fact, we discussed to Dominic on, um, it was one of the, the, the cases when we do accreditation, they, they're quite careful. They look through the files in quite detail and if they see anything that doesn't quite fit, they will pull it up as a case for discussion. It was a lady who had a triple negative breast, quite an aggressive cancer, two lines of treatment, actually had a PCR, good response, surgery reconstruction, and then the obviously the international accreditors saw no radiation. And she committed suicide. After going through two lines, there were issues going on in her family life and environment that none of us were aware of, hadn't been discussed, but the absolute heartbreak, because again, sometimes we don't even know what people are going through in their own lives. Mm. And, and we don't really talk about it, or we think we need to tough our way through it, or tough our way through it for our kids and our families or because our partners are going through issues we can't communicate with it and I, and I think we saw a lot of it through the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and this is really where this started you and I started talking and discussing and moving forward mm -hmm. the important issue around mental understanding of where we at with our own abilities, wellness, and abilities to cope. Mm -hmm. And this is why this is such an important separate topic for me than just general issues around, can I do the chemo, the surgery, the radiation, the endocrine treatment, but it's understanding a different level of us as a whole person and who's there to hold our hand. Thank you very much, Prof. And in summary there for the question, hopefully, since this is a very new aspect of oncology treatment and it is going to become more knowledgeable and it is going to become more, more acknowledged out there, it will reach the stage of being a standard part of treatment. Um, I'm going to go on to some further questions now and I will caveat before I do so that I'm aware I'm moving around the order that the questions came in, but I'm going to answer one quick question now on survivorship before we answer a couple that have come in on screening and tests and the like of that. The first one is um, a very interesting question on males with breast cancer. Prof, if you can answer the, how frequently are they seen? And then they probably do need a, a lot of different or special attention exactly. from a role such as a survivorship specialist in LIS. I'll let you answer those. So um, male breast cancer accounts for 1% of, of breast cancers that we see. Sub-Saharan Africa has a slightly higher incidence, sitting at about 2 to 3%. And it's a very, very important from a management point of view. So the, the cancer is managed almost identically to female breast cancers. But for a long time, we haven't looked at issues around... Um, how we preserve the male aesthetic space, how we acknowledge what is a very pink disease with men, how it impacts on them, how they see themselves from a, um, a, a, a manly point of view. In fact, um, Sarah Rain and myself, I think, Dom, you will remember, published an article on, on issues around um, uh, onco, um, psychosocial issues around male breast and male breast reconstruction. And this is really important. So again, I think, um, and I mentioned earlier, the survivorship glue that Liz is offering is critical for men, critical also for what we call special needs pop um, populations, such as young breast cancers, maybe young um, moms with families, um, people, elderly people, for anyone. So each person will have a special needs requirement and Liz through the life coaching will be able to assist us in terms of what we are may not be picking up from a clinical point of view. Also, men don't talk. You know, I can speak to your sister and she'll say, what's the goss at home? And what's this? And we will have those conversations where we'll sit together and but sometimes guys don't do that. They don't address it. And I don't want to be that. Shall always say, 
how do you know what guys think? Okay, I don't. <laughs> okay, but maybe no one else does either because you're not telling us. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. And your comment there, there Liz, in terms of, of special attention on survivorship for this um, uh, small but probably underrepresented population in breast cancer? My approach would be no different. You know, I, I think I, I would just, you know, approach them, try and meet them, you know, him where he's at uh, and try and work through the issues that he has um, himself, you know, which would be perhaps different to to the women. But really, um, you know, I, I think that's the whole point is it's so individualized. And that's the whole point about coaching is that it's it's for the individual. So Liz, I'm going to ask a question. Mm. Life coaching. Mm. OK. So what, what are you doing? What? Yes. Well, you know, you, you learn when you, when, you, when you learn to be a coach, um, you, you learn a, 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 um, a concept or a skill called motivational interviewing. And it's really just a way of, of asking a lot of questions, listening very intently, um, just to, to, to kind of get where, where somebody really is at. But then what's important about it, this is coaching, this is not therapy, okay? So the whole goal is to find out where people are at and then um, find out how you can help them move along to where they need to be, you know? So obviously they come to see me because they're all, you know, they're, they're in a state, they're confused, they don't know what's going on, whatever. My job is to work out where that is and then where they want to be and then actually help them get there with little tiny goals, little tiny um, behavior changes, et cetera. So coaching, uh, if done correctly, is very good at growing capacity. That's how we talk about it, where you, we grow your capacity mentally, emotionally, physically, and so on, to be able to cope better with what you're going through, if that makes sense. Excellent. That I think that's that's exactly what it's about. So each person individual this is what you're going through i'm listening to what the problems concerns etc and we're going to help you find ways to get to where you need to go yes and the whole point is this is driven by you it's driven by the patient because um, my job is to find out where you are but also what motivates you i mean why would you for example, go do chemotherapy that you're terrified of, et cetera. You know, and it's all driven by by you yourself. And it, it ends up me, you know, helping you find your own internal motivation uh, because you'll do something if, if it's for your own reasons, you know. Thank like you very that. much for that. Thank you. So I'm going to take our topic on a little bit of a tangent. We've had a lot of questions coming in around scans and uh, other more clinically relevant questions in survivorship. But I was thinking to myself, that is survivorship in a nutshell. It's when these extra questions come in. It's when these concerns arrive that weren't answered to your doctor. So I'm going to start it in chronologically order, then trying to group them myself. And we're going to go from the questions in the chat. The first one asks, shouldn't PET CT scans be done yearly to check for metastases? Okay. Even early stage one can become metastatic at a later stage. What checks can be done for this? Right. Um, go okay. for it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, so I actually had someone phone in about PET scans today. So let's talk about how you check your body. First, you got to know your norm. So if something doesn't feel right, rule of twos. If it's, you know, we all have that ache or pain. I've got this itchy rash at the moment from too much sun and things continue for too long, then they need to be investigated and checked. So I could say a rule of twos, okay? If it's there for two weeks and it's not going away, then it needs to be checked. How should it be checked? Well, that depends on what it is, okay? So it's not PET scans for everyone and MRIs for everybody. Different things get checked in different ways. So... You don't need to do um, blood tests to test for cancer, um, tumor markers all the time because they're highly inaccurate. So each cancer, as each person, needs an individual checks for screening and checks for cancers and cancers coming back. Again, you listen to your body because, I mean, I saw a lady today, went for a mammogram three months, said, no, there is a lump, and they told her, nope, not, and 
there was a lump. So then you need to know, has it been reviewed and has it been checked? When it comes to PET scans, okay, let's look at, this is where this whole story about cancers and sugar come in. So all cells eat sugar. Most cells eat with good table manners, okay. Certain amount of sugar each day, okay, and they're not overweight and they eat properly. Inflamed cells and cancer cells have bad table manners. They qu eat quickly and messily. Some very lazy cancers, don't eat that quickly and messily. So PET scans work for certain types of cancers. Some really lazy cancers may not be picked up. Some places, brain or something, may not be picked up. So you have to see what the symptom complex is and choose the right investigations for that. And that's where your clinical oncology team should be checking and they set up an individual program. So it used to be, we used to say, have mammogram six months post-treatment. That's your starting mammogram. And then we used to say six months thereafter. Now we know you don't need to do that. Six months after treatment, you can have your baselines. And then we can set up a separate program for each person. Mm -hmm. But again, the onus is on you. If someone tells you, someone's contacted in with me from Cape Town to say, raised tumor markers, these tests have been done, everyone's poo-hooing it, what now? Okay, there needs to be an answer to what a sensible explanation about what symptoms you have. Okay, that's why people who are really battling with joints and bone aches around hormonal treatment, I often tell them to take a, win to take a holiday, take a drug holiday for two weeks and see if those symptoms go away or not. If they don't go away, then it's probably not the medicines. So let's be it's not let's not send everyone for PET CT scans. That was the whole concept of if you hit an emergency room, you do a full body scans. Okay. Let's work out the right scans for the right person and take it step by step from there. Because otherwise you you get into this bad medicine concept of we scan you and your scan's fine and therefore go on, when actually we may be missing something because we're not doing take a history, examine, and personalize your treatment plan. Thank you very much. I have a number of questions on side effects and lifestyle changes that we're going to get to, and I'm going to put a pin in those for Dr. Hart to get a full discussion around them towards the end. I am just going to uh, address the number of questions that have come through that are specific case bases to Prof. Ben. Prof, another question comes through. If metastases con was confirmed with a CT scan, yes. where it started from a cancer of the breast and has spread to the lungs and the liver, my doctor recommends immunotherapy. What is your view on this? Okay. So I'm going to go back to the individualized treatment care. So immunotherapies are usually used for triple negative type breast cancers. When you've got a breast cancer and it metastasizes and it comes back elsewhere, so that individual cancer has sent out little terror cells that have woken up elsewhere, either while on treatment or off treatment. The first step is, to assess that it is the same cancer. So oftentimes what we need to do is we often do little biopsies and we check and we say, hey, you belong to the same family. You might be slightly different, but that's what you are. Then that goes back to a multidisciplinary team meeting and different cancers get treated differently. So um, some cancers require target therapies, some immunotherapies with um, chemotherapies. Some we have new type of targets, which are like breaks that we use with hormone therapies. So again, it's an individual treatment plan. If you've got access to trials and you've got secondary cancers, it's always a good idea to look at it because sometimes the new oncology drugs are extremely expensive and you have lots of co-payments with them on your medical aid. So again, have a look and see and check throughout the country what your option are if your cancers come back before you start treatment or if you've got an advanced cancer, what your options are for trials. Trials does not mean someone gets sugar water and someone gets something. It means this is the best of the best and something is being trialed against the best of the best. Thank you very much for that, Prof. And I'm going to address one more personal question before we um, uh, 
go back to some more directed questions for Dr. Hart. Prof, I have sent you a message just to keep it anonymous on the chat. Uh, and let me read out this question. I have a recurrence of breast cancer. I was two years in remission. Can a patient make decisions on their treatment if they want to have chemo or just have surgery and still carry on with a full life? Okay, so I think that I have a, a handout, which Dom, you've told me I've got to redo at some stage. We'll do it when you're back. It's called the Umbrella of Care. And how did cancer start? Every time a cell divides, it has abnormalities on the DNA. It has a couple more changes. It's supposed to be fixed by your own cell repair genes. When it doesn't, the little immune cells around it are supposed to kill it, and then it develops into its own little cancer plant. Really simple explanation. So... You cannot go, I'm going to cut something else and avoid another form of treatment because we are dealing with a disease that sometimes can send little terrorist cells elsewhere. So you can't replace one thing with another. However, today there are many, many changes in oncology and not everything is answered with chemo. So I encourage people to get involved in their treatment options always. Okay. And that is where also Liz plays a really important role. So you, if some surgeon tells you, oh, I'll cut off both your breasts and then you don't need chemo, they are telling you the wrong answer, okay? That's why if you are questioning what's happening in your oncology treatment plan, insist that it goes back to a robust MDM, get a second opinion, speak to a coach about it, and ask what the alternative options are, okay? But anyone who tells you you can replace one aspect of treatment with another is misinforming you. Thank you very much. And there are plenty of questions that are coming through. I'm going to skip over a number that are discussing screenings and follow-up tests and other cancers to be worried about. And if we have time towards the end, we'll readdress those. Jumping back, focusing on the survivorship questions. We have a comment, not a question that's come through, that the problem is there are so many patients in South Africa that are never discussed at an MDT meeting or receive a care plan. I don't know if you want to make a comment in conjunction with that before the next question. Well, Dom, I think you should because you're the one who's presenting on AI Oncology in Istanbul next week on exactly setting up where, where there's some form of more patient access into robust MDMs. And I'm going to absolutely say from a patient perspective, you need to insist and you need to get feedback. And an MDM is not where Liz is my friend and I send to her and she sends to the next one and we all discuss what we want to ensure that we all grow our own work. An MDM can be awkward in that I know in ours we have five different pathologists from different pathology labs, radiologists from completely independent radiologists, oncologists from different hospital groups, from different, um, and it doesn't matter if I don't like you or you don't like me, we have a robust and detailed multidisciplinary discussion. I mean, I wasn't even on the last one, okay? So I handed in the form of what I thought and it was discussed in detail, but I was on a flight. And I know because the feedback was via navigators, it was recorded, um, so I can get a full transcript on, on it. And that ensures patient safety. And we have to push for all patients to have access to that service. That's my take on it. Agreed, Prof. And, and as you said, we are presenting at an international congress in Turkey, not even two weeks from now, on the fact that regardless of distance region, we have the tools nowadays to provide this care to anyone in South Africa, where we're not the most technologically advanced country compared to the rest of the world, but we can manage it. We can show that yeah. these resources can be shared. And on our MDMs, we don't just have your treating oncologist and surgeon. We have survivorship specialists like Dr. Hart, geneticists, allied healthcare professionals as well. They're all part of the MDM. Uh, I'm going to go on to the next question, which is almost a, a mirror of the earlier one. Does medical aid cover the cost of a health coach? 
No, um, <laughs> because there's no there's no registration with the HPCSA at this stage for health coaching, as far as I know. But all the other health coaches I do know in South Africa have all got other medical qualifications, uh, whether it be um, you, you know in nutrition or um, or medical like me or or whatever. So they usually have other practice numbers um, that they can that they can use um, to claim back on. A difficult thing to get uh, new branches or new emerging fields to be recognized and it's a slow process yeah. but hopefully we'll get there i'm going to yeah. read a comment from louise the bhf who are sponsoring this to everyone here that the bhf does have passport booklets for patients that track yeah. their treatment provides practical information and supports them through the journey the next yeah. is a, another question that came through uh, it's quite a long one so i'm going to read it through verbatim as it was sent through Given that not many will have access to this important coaching for life after the initial treatment, is there a single source of information for best practice or recommended checkups, your diet, your lifestyle, your supplements that breast cancer survivors can go to? There's so much information out there and it can be intimidating for those with limited accesses to these resources or the internet or this knowledge. And also, I'm going to add on to that is which information do you trust? Because sometimes it, it is a bit contradictory. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's really my goal is to provide that. Um, I'm still in the early stages of, of putting it together. But I mean, my goal is really to provide information for anybody um, that is reliable and based on best practices right now, you know, and, and updated as, as things as things grow and change. So um, uh, yeah, I, I'm aiming to do that, but at the moment it's very scattered, and from what I can see, not not many. I don't know if anyone else in South Africa is doing proper survivorship right now. Yeah. So so um, I I definitely think that it's difficult to know how to access information, and it's a bit like um, your phone listens to you. So I often get people contacting about. I got asked today about the vaccine and cancer, and I can tell you the studies we did pre, during, and afterwards, the numbers were the same, okay? So it wasn't a vaccine and it wasn't a virus. That, um, and then I get asked about ivermectin and cancer, and I always say, you know, it's not that 10 years from now we, we looked at thalidomide in the 50s that caused those horrific effects to women where they the babies lost limbs that is now used to treat um, lymphomas and other cancers that who's to say in 10 or 15 years time we won't have studies on ivermectin cancer or something else but when something doesn't have a, a robust data background or being discussed in a robust environment so what you pick up on a chat room or because my friend or this happened or then you need to check your source and you need to see what the data behind the source shows. And that's again why, Dom, what you're doing in terms of the AI and the MDMs and what Louise does in terms of Passport and Breast Health Foundation, it means that you can keep on going back and verifying sources. And... um. That, that for me is always important. So if in doubt, question and try and work out your opinions. So, so for people to have access to information is important, but also then to verify where they're getting that information. And it's not about checking out with your friend, okay? It's about checking it out and there are good international websites i think dom you can list a good couple that you deal with through accreditation in the us in the uk and europe if you're not comfortable with what you're getting locally thank yeah, you very much for that yeah all right so um I'm going to read off some very supportive comments and I'm just going to answer one or two before I move on to the topic of side effects. And Dr. Hart, you're going to put you on the spot of answering some major side effects questions. Uh, I have a lot of people asking if there's going to be a recording of this session. Yes, there will be a recording of all the BHF webinars. It will be posted to their YouTube site. We'll get someone from the BHF to post a link to the YouTube site shortly, but every single webinar will be uploaded there or the previous ones 
should already be up and these ones should be up in about uh, two to three weeks after today. There's just a, a short backlog as we come up to October and Breast Awareness Month. And thank you very much for the supportive comment that we're so excited that this field of survivorship, that there's a coach and special uh, a specialist that is focusing on this um, this particular topic with such extent of knowledge. They comment that they're currently under psychologist who's never been through cancer and they don't feel like the connection is quite there. We love the proactiveness of a coach and a therapist coming in. Apologies for for the, the, the mixing of your words there a little bit on that comment. Let's move on to some questions directed at Dr. Hart. How can I manage the following side effects? And the one that comes to the top of this list is chemo brain. Um, okay. I, you know, there are lots of, lots of different answers to that. And there are lots of different, it, it, once again, it's, it's, it's individualized. Um, I what I do is I really start right at the beginning with lifestyle. I look at at you know how you're eating. I look at exercise. Exercise is big. Exercise is like a prescription. You should have it on a prescription pad given to you because in breast cancer it's super super important. For example, it's the best treatment for fatigue um, and chemo brain as well. So um, I I just and and but I also I've I've got a functional medicine background, so I also look at at you holistically. Um, one of the most important things is that you need a good gut health if you're going to have good brain health. So to keep your brain healthy, you need you need you know you need to keep your gut healthy. So I, I can I can advise you on what to do there. And then also there's specific supplements that can that can help you as well, um, depending you know on 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 where you're at. I don't know, Carol, if you've got ideas too. I, th I think what you're saying is exactly right. It's a real thing. It's like a chemo brain is a bit like having a, dr a near drowning. And and so Liz has um, covered everything really clearly from the exercise to the gut health to the um, supplements, but then also issues around brain training. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I remember taking um, the, the medical students for an exam and I'd got – such into a habit of getting the young consultants to do all the mental maths that suddenly I realized, geez, my mental maths was not what it was 10, 15 years ago. Because at school, when you have to do, no matter how bad we are at maths or English, you, you do all the subjects and you are continually training different parts of your brain. When you go through traumatic events and chemo that genuinely do affect you or menopause you have to say to yourself how are you training the different aspects of your brain again like you were doing at school so what are you doing around um everyone laughs at my duolingo i still can't order a glass of wine okay <laughs> in french <laughs> but <laughs> but i but I'm on almost 2,000 days, okay? So how are you training that aspect, your your mental mass, your um, hands, maybe floki, piano or something? You've got to train the different aspects of your brain all the time as you get older because otherwise you lose it. I was reading a very nice thing on, on becoming less supple as you get older. I can't touch my toes. And all those things that we've got to do little ways – of improving what has been either damaged by treatment, okay, or just by lack of use. That's a good comment, Prof. And there are a lot of little apps you can get nowadays on your phone. I know one or two were mentioned in the chat that just help you with, with simple day-to-day -day activities, memorizing the mental maths, the logic puzzles, and, and usage. It's Your brain is a muscle, and that's uh, what goes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to list off a side effect four, five, uh, two, three, four, and five, because something tells me that we're going to get a lot of very similar comments around <laughs> exercise and, and maybe certain supplements and the fact that it should be personalized. So the top five side effect questions that I came through, chemo brain we've done, but there was fatigue, joint pain and bone density, menopause sy symptoms, and depression. I don't know if you want to group some of those or address them as they come through, but the floor is yours. Um, 
As, yeah, as I said before, the, the studies that are coming out now are showing that the best treatment for fa fatigue is actually exercise, not not killing yourself. I mean, not that kind of thing, but there are specific guidelines as to as to how much exercise you should be doing. And actually, the people that are, are doing a bit of exercise on a day, uh, maybe four or five times a week, are, that treats the fatigue the best. Um, what was the other one? Um, joint pain. Um, well, that's like Carol said, you know, that could or could not be the, the medication and maybe having a medication holiday is worth doing um, just to see whether it's that or not. Um, my, my approach is, is, is as, as Dom said, it's, it's similar for everyone. You know, I, my whole goal is to get you as healthy as possible. Um, and I address the, the five areas. The areas I address are diet, exercise, sleep, stress management, and then your relationships and, and your community. And, you know, getting all of those in balance, it's unbelievable how if we get you properly healthy and balanced in those areas, how much better you start tolerating and and, and how, how much less obvious these side effects become. So um, it's, it, yeah, uh, th that that's my approach um, to Thank just you. about everybody. And obviously it, then it's individualized, obviously per person. And, and yeah. That makes the, perfect sense, well, yes, the, the, the holistic is, approach. Yeah. Mm. The people who super specialize, so um, I know Nicole, does a whole lot on exercise oncology and we've got massive groups who do it. So Liz's role is to work out what you need and to work out how you get to what you need. So like I said, she's the glue, okay? And that I think has been missing for a long time because we've got people doing, we're gonna check your cholesterol and manage your weight, et cetera. We people doing, we're gonna manage your exercise, et cetera. But the patient sits and not knows where that person needs to be. And it is different for each person. So someone who has a low bone density because they're a skinny malinx, okay, has a you have a different way of addressing it. So I've been in menopause forever. I do, you know, everyone laughs about my gym in the jar, my EMS training, but it's maintained because of the muscle stimulus on my bones that I've got a good bone density but that would be different from somebody who's got a poor do bone density because they've got history of maybe parathyroid disease or other diseases symptomatologies and is managed differently okay mm -hmm. so so you need to work out where you at on all issues and mental wellness for me is often the most critical to make sure the other wellnesses plug in because when we're not in a good headspace it's very very hard to conceptualize anything yeah i absolutely agree with that you know and that's where we need to start with many people um yeah Thank you so much. Uh, there's another section I'm going to go to, Dr. Harper. Let's address some of the comments that have come in the the, the chat first. Um, taking a look here, I believe this is just a comment in support of survivorship of a whole, that they love the life coach approach as a component of a breast cancer service for people diagnosed with breast cancer. They say in their personal experience, they were diagnosed back in 2005 and they were privileged to be able to go to a life coach who was also a GP like Dr. Hart. And they're emphasizing just how beneficial this was for them to not only focus on the medical side, but support the lifestyle as well. So they, they say that this is a crucial aspect for breast cancer patients and, and that this should be included in breast cancer service as a whole. Then there is a direct question coming in asking to address tamoxifen and its side effects. Prof, do you want to kick that one off? So tamoxifen is not an anti-hormone. It's not an anti-estrogen. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And some of the side effects are actually related to estrogenic effects. So it has positive and negative effects of different parts of our bodies. And today, sometimes in people diagnosed with breast cancer, well, firstly, not everyone needs tamoxifen. We have a group of endocrine medicines that we can use. But today, we can even genetically profile on cancers to see what the dosing of tamoxifen needs to be for some cancers. T's and C's apply, always, okay. 
If you are battling on symptoms, for example, on tamoxifen, my advice always is to either speak to your life coach or the doctor feel you most comfortable with, take a holiday off it for two weeks and see what your symptoms are off it for two weeks because then it gives somebody a starting point for what you can fix, what you can't fix, and what you need to change. And the principles are we want to understand the menopausal symptoms or the mental fuzziness. A lot has helped with exercise. The thing about weight and any medication is it's not the medicine that's making you pick up weight. It's changing you from a menopause point of view. You are hungry. Don't get hangry, you know, where you want to like just eat and eat and eat all the time. So those things are often helped a lot from a life coach point of view. I think um, also what I've seen is with all the the different hormonal, mod, you know, modulating drugs is that some some of those symptoms are often um, transient. So you start with something and you have some symptoms for two or three or four weeks and then they, they disappear and then you might get another one. But, you know, so you also have to give yourself a, a bit of time on it to, you know, to see how it goes um, and then have the holiday if, if you really are struggling. Yeah, I think that's important what you said about transient and also when we start medicines, I'm, I'm quite a fan of low dose and dosing upwards and not just going full dose onto it. And also, if you've come off chemo and radiation, um, then you just want to kind of feel where you're at before you start on your medicines because otherwise it's a bit like a stew. You're not quite sure what is causing what mm -hmm. and that makes it very difficult for your oncology doctor who understandably wants you completely compliant because we don't want your cancer to come back. And so that often is nicely sorted out from a life coach point of view in terms of guiding what we can fix and change. The the one set of symptomatology that no one should have to deal with, uh, which I mentioned when I was on with Trudy, is vaginal dryness, okay, and painful intercourse, okay. And part of relationships are physical relationships, and they don't have to be intercourse, but you need to be able to maintain with your change that your body's going through, work out where you sit with your intimate relationship with whoever you're intimate with. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's join the next two questions that we have together. And these are some preempted questions from before the webinar. Thankfully, we've caught up with everyone's questions in the chat and we welcome more to come in. The question is, are there any particular health issues that I must be on the lookout for after cancer, as well as do I need to look out for any long-term side effects? Dr. Hart, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> well, um, yes. Goodness me, that's that's throwing me a, a lot here. Um, but, a very bored question, I do understand, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so they're the obvious ones that, you know, if you're on a hormone blockade, for example, you're going to have things uh, like you're going to be at risk for um, for for decreased bone density, for example. Um, there are those. They're also, um, oh, I don't know, Carol, do you want to come in here? So I think there's so many. So so going through any treatment, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation, et cetera, some people will have um, minor radiation discomfort for two years. Some people will have, particularly people who smoke, maybe more radiation fibrosis. So again, I, I use the analogy a bit like, um, what's that movie? Is it Captain Marvel, The Blast? You blast, so you now are a d different person. So you've got part of the the leather jacket from your past, but you've got to incorporate your past with your future, the new you, okay? And uh, and are you battling with hair growth? Um, and, and these things, what you need to do is you need to look at, this is what I had, 
this is what I've been through and this is what is causing me problematic symptoms. I see a lot of people who have frozen shoulders post their oncology treatment. And I mean, I had one a, a while ago and I just, between a whole lot of exercise, exercised it out. But if you don't recognize that people get to the stage where you have a completely frozen shoulder and then they land up, when you go to surgery, all they do is they crack it all and which is for me not the best way to manage anything. So you've got to see what symptoms you're having. Is it radiation change and discomfort in the breast? Is it pain in terms of from under the arm from how you had your axillary surgery done? Do you need um, lymphedema specialist? Do you need uh, prehab and rehab? Do you need exercise? Is it from hair? Is it skin that you're worried about? Is it gynecological symptomatology? bone density, um, aches and pains in your joints. So you, you've got to sensibly list what is bothering you. And mm -hmm. we must also be careful that we don't become too much, too, too focused on what's bothering us. Because what happens is pain and discomfort, anxiety and stress is always worse at night. Why is that so? Because during the day when our, our little bodies like computers have different windows open, whether it's office and teams or this and that. It's hard for us to point out exactly where that ache and pain is or that discomfort is or that anxiety that we're worrying about. When we shut down at night, okay, we're shutting down everything to a screensaver. And that's when, when all the things that worry us, the, the aches and pains, the anxiety, that comes to a fore. And those are sometimes, Liz, I think that having some form of nightly ritual is a help for a lot of people. I'm a big off my phone, I read. No matter how tired I am, I will read. And you know what I read? Rubbish, okay? <laughs> Rom-coms, this, that. I don't do my medical reading at night. I just read something where I can have a laugh and put me in a different headspace before I go to bed. As yeah. long as it's not Mills and Boone's prof. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you worried yes. about it? We're looking for I'd the handsome guy. I'd love to guy. comment on um, what's been discussed as well there in terms of long-term side effects. And I know I'm known as a bit of a, a Grinch when it comes to some medical opinions and some opinions out there. But I put the, the idea back on your previous comment, doctors, on know your norm and changes to your norm is what you must look out for. If you list side effects to look out for and you go hunting for them, you're probably you're going to find what you go hunting for them. So don't condition your mind to look for something. Rather know what you should be and look for a change in your norm. It's it's the common little little mental trick of where you tell someone that your tongue doesn't fit in your mouth and suddenly they realize it doesn't <laughs> and it's sitting there and, and it's not comfortable where it is. I can um, touch my nose with my tongue. <laughs> Very impressive. Your your skills no, are wasted, I can't Prof. Do that. <laughs> there is a question that's come through as well, and um, I know, Prof, you went through through a phase of a co absolute combat cocktail of um, uh, supplements. Yes. The question comes as apart from pre probiotics, omega three and vitamin D. What supplements will you recommend someone? Okay. This is my field. Um, <laughs> I think, um, I, you know, generally everybody should be on a very good multivitamin mineral combination um, because, you you know, your body is this incredibly sophisticated organism and it will heal itself if you give it a little bit of everything. But everything works in synergy. So don't just take vitamin D, you know, take all the other vitamins and minerals with it because then you'll get better absorption and the vitamin D will work better, for example. So I saw on that, omega-3 is super important, um, super important for your gut health, for your brain health and and you know with that chemo it, it's destroying cells um and and you want you know new cells to be formed etc and you need omega-3 to make new cells you need you need protein as well for that but um so yeah a basic multivitamin omega-3 vitamin d is great zinc is great because it's good for your immunity and for your gut um and uh if you've been on um 
if you've been on the the ACT um, and, the, and some of the the chemotherapies that are very hard on your heart, coenzyme Q10 is also a good one for that. Um, and there beyond that, I, I, I'm not going. I, I, then I'd individualize. You know, then 100%. then we're going to talk. Yeah, hundred percent. Because the Thank thing you. is, you've got to individualize once you go through the basic building blocks about what do you need to supplement. So someone like me who has three cups of coffee and four cups of green tea a day and rushes around and then comes home and gobbles down a meal like diesel, Charles says, that's like the, one of the puppies, then we'll probably need a different supplementation. So yes, I combat supplement sometimes, sometimes, and you've got to be really careful because you don't want to do them like like I do it with, with my pellets in the, where you take like 10 and then wonder why you've got burning epigastric pain in the morning. <laughs> so, and you've also got to be careful that you don't get side effects to your supplements. I um, went through a stage, I was taking so much and I got this rash and then I got this peripheral, um, the sensory neuropathy for overdosing on Rykel. So it's not just a case of supplements or medicines like anything else. Mm. You can't just suddenly go, oh, I've got a cancer I'm now going to supplement myself silly with everything I can find because also some things can react or interact. In fact, I had a lovely chat with Liz today about um, a patient she spoke to and to coordinate with the oncologists who can often be quite anti-supplements, what is sensible and not sensible because what you don't want is to take something that counteracts how your oncology drug is working. So it's really, really a very detailed supplements or medicines. They are medicines like anything else. So you want to understand how and what you're taking it, when you're taking it, and what you need. Thank you very much. And, and I am going to ask for my own interests. Dr. Hart, you mentioned numerous times there a multivitamin. And mm. a multivitamin seems kind of like a like a very bundled term in my head. Is there like a specific one to look out for? Some better than others? Is are all multivitamins the same? What, what would you use to measure which yeah. multivitamin to choose? That's a difficult question. It's, I know it's a very difficult question. Um, the, the the more expensive ones are the better ones. I hate to tell you, because they're basically you know what you want is something that's actually plant sourced that actually comes from food. So if you know a supplement that actually is derived from actual plants um, is is going to have way is going to be way better absorbed by the body than something that's con uh, completely synthetic. Um, you know, like ascorbic acid is supposedly vitamin C, but vitamin C is way, you know, vitamin C in its natural form is way more complex than just ascorbic acid. So, you know, yeah, ideally you want to take something that comes from plants. Um, so there, there are a couple in South Africa that you can get hold of. Um, that does but, make sense. Mm. Does what about sense. juicing? Can you get, can you get in a lot of your supplements if you say juice or something like that? You can juice. Um, it's it's quite a concentrated um, like whack of of nutrition in one shot, and some people struggle with that and and get you know quite bad sort of almost detox reactions and and so on. So um, you know some yeah, but some people do really really well on juicing. So it is it is very concentrated nutrition. So um, you've got to individualize it again. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you very I'm much careful. for that. With somebody yeah. who's who's sorry, whose liver's like very overloaded from a ton of chemo, that might yes. be too much. Actually. Okay, so that's important to know. Okay. Thank you. So we have had a string of new questions come in in the last minute or two, and I am being cognizant of our time. So I'm going to ask you to focus down the following few questions. Let's finish off on the supplement and say, please comment on the following three supplements: curcumin, AHCC, and salvesterols. Okay. Is there anything specific to be aware of or look from there or? Curcumin is great. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's really good for your gut. Um, I, the, the, I would say that's fabulous. I don't know what AHCC is. I, I don't know. Um, and sylvesterol is probably, is that a plant? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. yeah. It's one so of the AHCC plant is cereals. active hexose correlated compound. Uh, shiitake mushrooms. Oh, the Chinese goodness. traditional medicine yeah. based. Okay. Yeah. There's lots of good evidence on, on mushrooms and, and, and anti-inflammatory 
and, and, and brain so health as well. It, it yeah. pops up your brain um, uh, serotonin levels in about five minutes where some of the um, an, uh, antidepressants take uh, two weeks. But again, it's not a just buy it over the counter. It's about individualized for each person with help of specialists in the field. And again, discussed through an MD, MDT. So for a while, there was a lot of data on curcumin and um, um, you shouldn't take it. But smokers shouldn't take it, increased lung cancer risk, et cetera. Then the change. So a little bit about our, our, our data with the um, THCs. Originally, we, we were like, no, and now we know that endocrine sensitive cancers can, but HER2 cancers can't take them, and um, triple negative. So it's not one size fits all for any of these medications. And there needs to be a sensible discussion what you on? Tell your doctors what you're taking and why, and make sure that it is brought into the discussion so that you're guided about what's best for you. Thank you very much, Prof. And just to fit everyone's last few questions in, uh, another quick one that I think would be on on supplements. I've had a problem with my tummy ever since I've been to treatment, chemo and radiation. I've done CNC, but nothing has been resolved. Oh, liquid probiotics, guys. Hey, no water keeper, Prof. Gut. Yeah, I've gut got gut. a yeah. There's a I've got a gut protocol that you yeah. You see that the, the chemo damages your gut lining and gives you leaky gut, and and you often have problems after that. And I think it's important to heal your gut. The the um the pro the probiotics are really important. Your diet is really important. You know, yeah. with fiber, the which is fiber is prebiotics essentially. Yeah. Um, and then L-glutamine is is very is a very powerful um, uh, gut healing agent, um, and omega three is the other very, very uh, omega three and zinc also all um, heal the gut. So um, yeah, go on a protocol of that for say three months, and and you should be back to normal. Thank if you, you so fin- much. If you've finished your treatment, yeah. Then mm. two very difficult questions, Prof, that have come in here at the end. Um, the first is, I believe, a direct question following someone's treatment. Would an MIR, MRI of the chest not have mentioned a cyst on my liver? The MRI said nothing about a liver cyst, but three months later, the radiation planning scan mentions an interstitial liver cyst. Should it not have been seen on the initial MRI? Okay, so I, I always talk about an MRI as, so people often over investigate early stage cancer and you've got so much sitting in your oncology basket your mri is your google map it's looking at if you're going to start with surgery okay so if you've got advanced cancers and cancers in the gland they'll do an mri and a ct scan but if you've got an early stage cancer what they'll do is do an mri they'll check both your breasts checks the glands in the midline your glands under the arm and it's like looking into the window saying oh your lungs look sort of fine and your liver looks sort of fine and that's all you need okay when you go for your radiation planning scan they do a planning ct and now it's going looking in a different direction and if they see something on your liver uh, it could be an incidental cyst it could be so it's unlikely less than two percent of early stage cancers of surgery radiation and then something that you have metastatic disease but it can happen but really okay you if you see something on the planning scan on a ct the best investigation for the liver is actually a liver mri prime of a scan okay so they're different scans to look at different things but you want a sensible safe way of approaching it because every time you're scanning you're also using a whole lot of contrast etc that are not necessarily also that good for you so you've got to be careful about over scanning and overlooking and finding things incidentally because if you find it you need to investigate it and investigate it further and then you have the anxiety also of what is this I went through a super anxious phase where I finally said to Charles, that's it, I'm going to scan for life. I'm scanning from my brain down. And he, his comment was, that's right, you go do that, babe. And when we find something in your brain or that you don't have a brain and that you can't do anything about, what are you going to do then? You're going to worry more. 
Okay. So there has to be a sensible approach with anything on how you scan. Thank you very much for that. And unfortunately, our last question of the evening, because we are out of time, any advice on how to handle people's comments on why didn't you just have a mistake to me and get it over and done with? They're finding that people always have comments and do not want to hear that you're, you're trying to save the breast for the chemo first and, and these type of questions. You're almost judged for not jumping for a mistake to me first. Prof, I know you're going to have a very um, vocal <laughs> comment on this. So I'm going to let Dr. Hart go first and then take well, it away. You know, I hope if that happens to you, you phone up one of us immediately and talk to us. You know, I've seen how every single patient in this unit is so carefully um, planned. You know, every test that's done and everything's done in the right order, everything's done the right way, nothing slips through the cracks, everything's done properly. So if you've been told you need breast conserving surgery versus a mastectomy, um, that has been very clearly decided by a multidisciplinary team who knows what they're doing. And and um, it upsets me terribly <laughs> when when people who don't know anything think they actually can have better advice than this incredible multidisciplinary team that you're with. So, yeah, um, please yeah. just reach so, out. So I think <clears throat> that it's your body. If you want to have a mastectomy, you can have a mastectomy. But remember, when something's in the bucket, you can't put it back. So you lose nothing by taking a less is more approach. Mm. Small and safe is you can go big, okay, but you can't go back from there. Okay. So when you are anxious and when you are stressed, make small steps, small decisions, and do it with help and assistance. And we must always remember the first rule in medicine is do no further harm. So it's not about offering bells and whistles. We can take this out and solve this and you can have your face done and your this done, etc. We want you safe through whatever your journey is. And as you are stabilizing on it, you can then, when you're feeling slightly more in control, okay, decide whatever you want to your body, okay? But be very, very careful throwing yourself into the deep end of something and I think Liz you know because I sent you somebody where you are completely traumatized by doing massive things and then not being able to step back from it thanks very much for that prof and I'd like to make my own comment from very much back office and statistician there on treatment options um a lot of data has come out recently that changes this perspective on mastectomy versus BCT. And obviously, cancers are different type and personalized treatment trumps everything. But we're an internationally accredited unit that is reviewed by a board that looks at over 650 oncology centers worldwide, as well as numerous international sites. And with our treatment numbers, we're almost at the stage when nine out of 10 patients do not receive a mastectomy. And we are awarded full accreditation and international teaching site status. But, Mas but, but also, Dom, you know what it is, that the data has changed. 40 years ago, mastectomy was a gold standard. Now we know that the survival is actually better. If you exactly. do a smaller operation, I think you sat doing abstracts with me last night on Eris, enhanced recovery after surgery, smaller surgeries, better outcomes. Liz has commented on the gut and the immune. We also know bigger surgeries drop your immune system and those exactly. impact on your cancer outcomes. Exactly. Mastectomy is not a, a better solution. The no. five and 10 year survival rates on conservative treatment, breast conservation therapy is actually coming back as better than mastectomy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that is about all the time we have for tonight. I'm going to end on one last comment uh, from one of the, the ladies out there. Dr. Hart, if you want to prep any uh, way of contacting you 
I'll give you a moment to provide that with the room, and then we'll hand over to Louise to close up for the evening. Uh, it's a big comment on that lady who mentioned um, uh, handling people's comments around mastectomy. She says that she wasn't given a choice. She received a double mastectomy, and she was too shocked and scared to ask for help from a state hospital in Cape Town. She emphasizes that it is your body and your journey, and you have a right to be part of the decision-making process. And that is a very true and powerful statement. Thank you very much. Dr. Hart, if you want to provide any method of contacting you for anyone who's interested sure. in anything going forward. Yes, the website is heartreach.life, H-A-R-T, reach.life. And there's a contact form there if you want to just send me that. My email address is drelizabethhart at gmail.com. And yeah, I'd love to hear from you. I think this was such an excellent, excellent webinar. We're going to have to do it again at some stage. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> For sure. Thank you so much. And then as always, I will hand over to Louise from the Breast Health Foundation. Uh, it is through their efforts that we can have these webinars and have these discussions. And um, Louise, I've given you a uh, chat. Please feel free to close us up for this evening. I uh, see she's still muted. I'm just making sure technically we have it there. I'm unmuted. There we go, Louise. We can hear you loud and clear. Um, you have the privilege of being the only person who can mute. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart. Um, I've learned a lot, and um, I'm always eager to learn more, and our patients are learning a lot. And Carol, the, I think this quiz night with the difference has been a tremendous success where our patients have the opportunities to ask the questions and um, learn from each other and learn from the doctors on site. So thank you very much, Dr. Hart. I'm sure we're going to be tapping into your um, brain power and your resources very soon. And Carol, as always, thank you for joining us. Looks thank like you've you. had a, a bit of a tan there. I, I tan. I'm red. I was red like a lobster, <laughs> like a lobster. You must see the family photos. <laughs> well, lobster. Thank you very much, Doctor. And we ready for October. Thank you, everybody, oh. and thanks, Tom, once again for his managing mm -hmm. our questions and managing the ladies on screen. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good night, everybody. And as always, keep a look at this, Stace. These webinars will continue on. We're coming up for a very busy October going forward, and we're looking to host some more webinars towards the end of the month, as well as some one-on-one -on -one question sessions with Prof. Ben. As always, the details will be shared through the Breast Health Foundation social media site, as well as Prof. Ben's. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Bye.